Hello everyone, this is Brother Carl Tester and welcome to Revelation chapter 10. In this chapter we're going to find a mighty angel coming down from heaven with a little book open in his hand. This chapter, along with the next, have long been understood by historicists as speaking of that major event that changed the course of world history and that is of course the European Reformation. The Reformation delivered a little open book, the Bible, the lively oracles of God, back into the hands of the people after it had been taken from them and deliberately hidden for over a thousand years. This was a massive earthquake with profound religious, social, political and economic consequences that ended the Dark Ages by unveiling the world to the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to ask that you note that Revelation chapter, chapters 10 and 11 should be taken in together as they are dealing with the same subject matter. So I think that it would be helpful that as you finish chapter 10, you proceed straight to chapter 11. The outbreak of the Reformation was at a point in history when such a thing could not have been anticipated by the pundits. The papacy was at the monstrous height of its power and glory and it seemed as though everything and everyone was held under their iron sway. Heretics were dispatched and the voices of opposition were silenced. And when we contemplate the depths of the darkness that the world was in, we quickly realise that it could only be a miracle of God, a true moving of his spirit to change the situation and this is exactly what occurred. For all the flaws we could point to in Martin Luther and the Reformation, and there are many, yet it was nonetheless a mighty work of God in the affairs of human history, and it changed the course of the world for the better. We read here from a book called A History of the Church from the Earliest Ages to the Reformation, Volume 2, by George Waddington, the following. Thus it was in the beginning of the Reformation. Never was the court of Rome more confident in the sense of security than at that instant. The various heresies which had so long disturbed the church were for the most part dismayed and silenced. The temporal monarchy of Rome was more firmly established than at any former period, and her power and influence still considerable in every part of Europe. Her ecclesiastical agents were never more numerous or more zealous in her service. From another book called History of the Reformation in the 16th Century, Volume 1, by J. H. Mel Dubois, we read this. At the period when the Reformation was about to burst forth, Rome appeared in peace and security. One might have said that nothing could ever disturb her in her triumph. E.P. Cashemail says in his book, The Visions of Daniel and the Revelation Explained, the next great event in European history was the outburst of the glorious Reformation. There is no other event but the Reformation from St. John's time down to the present that can be shown to answer to this series of visions, but that one does in every particular. And the writer is, of course, referring to Revelation chapters 10 and 11. He goes on. Sudden, unexpected, the human instrumentality apparently so inadequate, the results of such surpassing and enduring importance, if ever event had the character of some direct intervention of divine providence, this one had. From the very popular Halley's Bible Handbook by Henry Halley, we read this from the 1965 version concerning the Word of God. It says, modern history has been an era of the open book, in a sense never before known. Every blessing of modern civilization is a direct product of the open Bible. Civil and religious liberty, popular education, social reform, liberty of conscience and freedom of speech. What a wonderful thing it is to have an open Bible, and what a dreadful life it must have been to have lived in those days for more than a thousand years where the precious truth of God was hidden by the Church of Rome from the people. 
Now, as I understand it, the more modern versions of Halley's Bible Handbook have been amended to remove references to the Church of Rome and the papacy as that great anti-Christian power that took the scriptures from the people and made war against his saints. Unfortunately, Rome has many allies and the work of the Counter-Reformation has not stopped. But praise the Lord, we have an open Bible and it is open to all those who will read it and avail themselves of its precious truths. At this point, I'm going to include a relevant excerpt from part six of my series called An Examination of Preterism and Other Things from an, Histor from an Historicist Perspective. Jesus said, By their fruits ye shall know them. Now this is true not only of preachers and teachers, but also of their doctrines. Now, when we consider the two Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation eschatological approaches to the book of Revelation, those being preterism and futurism, when we compare these with historicism, it becomes clearly apparent what this means. What fruit has preterism and futurism ever brought forth? And what fruit has historicism brought forth? that we might know whether this be of God or not. The facts are plain. Preterism has produced no fruit of the Spirit. Futurism also has produced no fruit of the Spirit, but rather it has led to aggressive US foreign policy in the Middle East, and that has cost the lives of many people, and different books have been written about this. But when we consider historicism, what fruit has this ever produced? Again, the facts are clear. Historicism produced the Reformation. The Reformation did not produce historicism. The Reformation was a result of historicism. Equal with this, of course, was the discovery that the only saviour, the only mediator between God and man, was the Lord Jesus Christ. In referring to the great European Reformation, Henry Grattan Guinness said this in his book, Romanism and the Reformation. It is self-evident to the historicists that had the prophecies been misinterpreted, applied otherwise than according to the mind of the spirit, there would never have been this productive and blessed consequence. The fact that understood and and applied as they were by the reformers, they have produced spiritual and eternal good to myriads of mankind is a proof that they were rightly applied. For, quote, by their fruits ye shall know them, end quote, is true not only of teachers, but of their teachings. Protestantism, with all its untold blessings, is the fruit of the historic system of interpretation. The fact is that the Reformation and historicism are inextricably linked together and this is the understanding of the scriptures that we are presenting in this entire series of presentations. From the Reformation we get such famous principles as sola scriptura, meaning scripture alone, the Bible alone is our highest authority, praise the Lord. Sola fide, meaning faith alone. We are saved through faith alone in Christ Jesus. It's not of works, it's not of fleshly works, praise the Lord. Sola gratia, grace alone. We are saved by the grace of God alone, not by the authority of a priest, not by the authority of the Pope, praise the Lord. Sola, solus Christus, Christ alone, Jesus Christ alone is our Lord, Saviour and King. Soli Dio Gloria, to the glory of God alone. We live for the glory of God alone. Praise ye the Lord. Preterism is an invented interpretation. Futurism is an invented interpretation. And historicism is revelation. Preterism, futurism and other approaches to Bible prophecy have all worked to increase confusion and this is the classic hallmark of Babylon which means confusion. 
And again, I invite you to view part six of the series called An Examination of Preterism and Other Things for more of the details if you are interested. Many Christians, probably most Christians, I think, have very little interest in their own Christian history. How is it that we have an open Bible and where do these religious freedoms come from that we enjoy? It's a great shame that these things are not more widely known. Again, we read from Halley's Bible Handbook the following. It is impossible to understand the present condition of Christendom except in the light of history. But, alas, ignorance of church history is more widespread even than ignorance of the Bible. We believe it is the duty of ministers to teach their people the facts of church history. Of course, some of the barriers to preaching church history are these. Number one, Christians are not interested in their own church history. And that's sad but true. Number two, it is politically incorrect to identify the persecutor, once identified by all Protestant church leaders as the Church of Rome. Nowadays, of course, not many people are game to name the name of this greatest persecutor of Christians down through the ages. Many church leaders, number three, many church leaders are now embarrassed by the break from Rome. You actually have leaders of very large churches in America apologizing for the Reformation, apologizing for ever breaking off from the Church of Rome. How foolish. The fourth barrier that I've listed here to the teaching of church history is this. In the age of the prosperity gospel, motivation and feel-good sermons, there is simply no interest in talking about the shed blood of the saints that's referred to in the scriptures. People don't really want to hear about the sufferings that the people of the past have gone through to deliver to us an open Bible and these tremendous freedoms that we enjoy. The fifth obstacle I've listed here is this. As the majority of modern Christians believe in the rapture, there is no foundation understanding of the historical, prophetical application of the scriptures. And where we are here doing our bit to try and fix that up. Praise the Lord. Now, the next matter that I would like to deal with is to show that there is a clear and orderly movement of events recorded in Revelation chapter 9 to those found in Revelation chapters 10 and 11. We are moving from the Eastern Roman Empire, which had been killed, as we saw in the last part. We're moving from that back to the West, that is back to Europe. We have seen the rise of Islam in the East under the fifth trumpet and the Saracens, and that was to torment the inhabitants of the Eastern Roman Empire. And then it moved into the sixth trumpet to the Turks, and that was there and appointed to kill the third part of men with fire, smoke and brimstone. And we've examined that in detail. And we have also seen that the, this Islamic scourge was a clear threat to the West. And it looked as though it might well overrun the West as well. But it was not to be as God had appointed the bounds and the times of both the Saracens and the Turkish Islamic woes. And when they had reached their appointed time and place, he stopped them and turned them back. So as we come to Revelation chapter 10, the point we are now at is that the Turkish Ottoman Empire is reigning supreme over in the east. And the last thing the prophecy told us in Revelation chapter 9, starting in verse 20, is this. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So as we discussed previously, the, this reference to the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not, is a reference to those back over in the West, those back in Europe, where we are coming to now. Those over in the West saw the East steeped in idolatry and corruption, 
and they saw them wiped out by this great Islamic scourge, but they took no lesson from the fall of the East, and they continued steeped in idolatry, priestcraft, and corruption. God gave them space to repent, God gave them warning, and they did not amend their ways, but continued in their wickedness. And this brings us to Revelation 10, and included under the sixth trumpet are the contents of Revelation chapters 10 and 11, which bring before us the European Reformation and the little open book, the Bible. And the connection between Revelation 9 and 10, the connection between the Turkish Islamic woe and the European Reformation is fascinating. The two events, while seemingly so far apart, are in fact inextricably linked together by the plan and purpose of God. We read here from a Protestant writer, James Aiken Wiley, in his book, The History of Protestantism, Volume 1, and he talks about the connection between the Turks and the Reformation and says this, Asia owned the scepter of Soliman, also pronounced Suleiman, Soliman the Magnificent, Often were his horde seen hovering like a cloud charged with lightning on the frontier of Christendom. When a crisis arose in the affairs of the Reformation, and the kings obedient to the Roman see had united their swords to strike, and with a blow so decisive that they should not need to strike a second time, the Turk, obeying one who he knew not, would straightway present himself on the eastern limits of Europe, and in so menacing an attitude that the swords unsheathed against the poor Protestants had to be turned in another quarter. The Turk was the lightning rod that drew off the tempest. Thus did Christ cover his little flock with the shield of the Moslem. The material resources at the command of these potentates were immense, and of course he's talking about the papacy. They were the lords of the nations and the leaders of the armies of Christendom. It was in the midst of these ambitions and policies that it seemed good to the great disposer that the tender plant of Protestantism should grow up. The truth took root and flourished, so to speak, in the midst of a hurricane. How was this? Where had it defence? The very passions that warred like great tempests around it became its defence. Its foes were made to check and counter-check each other. Their furious blows fell not upon the truth at which they were aimed, and which they were meant to extirpate, they fell upon themselves. Army was dashed against army. Monarch fell before monarch. One terrible tempest from this quarter met another terrible tempest from the opposite quarter, and thus the intrigues and assaults of kings and statesmen became a bulwark around the principle which, was, which it was the object of these mighty ones to undermine and destroy. Now it is the arm of her great persecutor, Charles V, that is raised to defend the church, and now it is beneath the shadow of Solomon the Turk that she finds asylum, how visible the hand of God, how marvellous his providence. Praise the Lord for that. Over a few more pages in the same book, James Wiley records the charge that was made against the Protestants, and he says this, It is you, said the adherents of the old creed addressing the Lutherans, who have brought this scourge upon us. It is you who have unloosed these angels of evil. They come to chastise you for your heresy. You have cast off the yoke of the Pope, and now you must bear the yoke of the Turk. Not so, said Luther. It is God who has unloosed this army whose king is Abaddon the destroyer. They have been sent to punish us for our sins, our ingratitude for the gospel, our blasphemies, and above all, our shedding of the blood of the righteous. And what Martin Luther is recorded to have said here is spot on. The prophecy said, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of, their, of the works of their hands. They repented not of idolatry. They repented not of their murders, their sorceries, their fornication, nor their thefts. And this is the reason why this great destroyer has come down upon Europe. 
This is the flow of events from Revelation chapter 9 through to Revelation chapter 10. In another book, A History of Slovakia, The Struggle for Survival by Stanislav Kirschbaum. I don't know if I've pronounced that correctly, but let's not worry about that. We read this. What made the Reformation such a challenge to the Habsburgs was the fact that the wars with the Turks helped the spread of Protestantism. From another book called The Long European Reformation by Peter Wallace, we read, The Turks helped to save the Protestant Reformation. And from another book called Global Connections by John Coatsworth and others, we read, Ottoman rule had the unexpected effect of helping the Protestants survive there in the face of hostility from those same powers. So from what we have just looked at, we can see why it is that we find the events of Revelation chapter 10 and also chapter 11 coming under the sixth trumpet. The Islamic Turkish woe and the European Reformation are linked to each other. Although Islam and Christianity are diametrically opposed to each other, although Islam is Antichrist, it was nonetheless used by God to keep the papacy, papal Europe in check, and to prevent them from totally wiping out true Christianity from the face of the earth. As it says in Proverbs 21 verse 1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. And so it is that we find our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, seated on the throne as we saw in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, directing the affairs of the nations and we can praise the Lord for that. Now there is still more to add to this, which I'm going to cover off in the next parts. And I want to point out that it was not only Turkish aggression alone that allowed the Protestant Reformation to flourish, but it was also the production of the little book open, the open Bible. And this is also connected with the Turkish capture of Constantinople and the fall of the East. Because as Constantinople came under siege, Many scholars fled, fled from that city into Europe and they fled with ancient manuscripts in their hands and these were copies of the Holy Scriptures and they took them into the places of learning in Europe. And this is another aspect of the connection between the sixth trumpet and the little open book in Revelation chapters 10 and 11. Now with that, I'm going to end Revelation chapter 10, part 1, and continue in the next part.